We know Islam's superior to all the rest today because it hates the Jews and marries kids and because it kills the gay. But if you're in the market for something less bloodthirsty, come chat with me and David Wood on the night before Thursday. It is indeed Wednesday night, ladies and gentlemen, and you know what that means. It is time for this week in Jihad with the great Dr. David Wood. Welcome, David, to yet another epic show. It's going to be pretty epic. It is. Assu we got to ass some serious assuming, jihad assu here. Assuming there's been any jihad, because I have i can't recall seeing much uh, in the news. There has unfortunately been quite a lot of jihad. That's weird. And quite a lot of stupid infidels. And so uh, what do you want first, David? You got any preference here, stupid infidel or jihad? Oh, uh, gosh, that's kind of a coin flip there, Robert. It's all so <laughs> exciting. <laughs> All right, well, the big story, I suppose, is yet another triumphal mosque. Uh, two weeks ago, when we were last in this space, we discussed the uh, conversion, or not the conversion, the construction of the new Ram Mandir temple in India on the site of a mosque that was on the site of a previous Hindu temple at the birthplace of the god Ram, and consequently this is a very important site for Hindus, and we discussed the practice of Islamic triumphal mosques being built precisely on the cherished sites of other religions so as to show the victory and supremacy of Islam. And this week we have the news that the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is planning on February 23rd, a scant two weeks from now, to open up the Kora Church in Istanbul, occupied Constantinople, as a mosque. The Kora Church is one of the most uh, historic and iconic, so to speak, churches of uh the, of Eastern Christianity contains icons that are considered a World Heritage Site by UNESCO, UNESCO, and uh, they are some of the most beautiful artworks in the world. The church dates back to the 14th century and is built on the site of previous churches going back to the 3rd century. So why on, why on earth would Erdogan want to put a mosque there? That's not very tolerant and and broad-minded is it david uh no but uh yeah so e e world leaders they have to decide whether we want to be part of the uh modern uh, you know tolerant world where you try not to offend people unless you have to and things like that and that's that's the mindsets of lots of people or the traditional muslim mindset of hey we you know the kaaba that's the center of pagan worship we got to take that and make it our own uh the temple mount that's a that's a the, the heart of uh jewish religion and, and so we you know we have to take that over uh what's the center of uh what's the the, the heart of of christianity uh Constantinople and the uh, Hagia Sophia, and so we have to control that. And just every step of the way, uh, every place that's dear to Hindus, every place that's dear to Christians, every place that's dear to uh, Jews, every place that's dear to uh, to to pagans, they have to have it. They they have to have it. They have to control it. And so Erdogan is uh, is going in the in the traditional uh, Islamic direction, and. As revolting as it is, there is that positive side uh, in that it just it helps us expose the hypocrisy. I mean, you, you can't you can't be more hypocritical. Erdogan will uh, will uh, open a church as a mosque and then the next week complain when Hindus uh, take back what was once their, you know, some new temple or something like I mean, some old that was once their old temple and they retake it or something like that. And, and he'll complain. There's there's no, I, I've never seen anything like this where. There is just absolutely zero concept of consistency and hypocrisy is uh, a virtue and, and not a problem. And welcome, welcome to Islam. It's because the Muslims are the best of people 
and the infidels are the most vile of created beings, according to the Quran. That's chapters 3, 110, 3 verse 110 and 98 verse 6, for those of you who are keeping score. And so the same rules simply don't apply to the two groups because Islam is superior. This is an interior of the Korah church showing some of the ancient and priceless iconography inside. And I'd also suggest, David, that not only is this a triumphal mosque showing the victory of Islam over Christianity and over its sacred images, but also the victory of Islam over secularism, because the Turkish Republic, of course, is ostensibly secular, although Erdogan has been rolling that back for years now. And the Korah Church, like Hagia Sophia, the grandest church in the Christian world for a thousand years, they have been museums. They were made museums early in the 20th century and were museums for about 80 years. And now they are about, the, Hagia Sophia is already a mosque and the Korah Church is about to become a mosque. The idea is that Islam is victorious over secularism that would make these into museums that people of all faiths can enjoy. So Islam is just breaking out in victory all over, David. And so uh, you see? Yeah. They, well, uh, I have to I have to say it's I can't see that it's really a victory. I I view it as like a, a last uh, pathetic uh, attempt to uh, turn the tides. Um, we've talked many times before about the the trajectory, uh, the trajectory. Um, <laughs> you know the reference? Yes, well, this is well, this is yeah. our friend Muhammad Hijab, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. So they're focused on trajectories, which is interesting because I focus on trajectories as well. Not just, You don't just look at what's in front of you. You look at the trajectory and Muslims are looking at the trajectory. And the trajectory has, is that uh, just, you know, b between uh, between like 15 to 20 years ago and now, the apostasy rate of uh, younger Muslims has gone from close to zero percent to around 25 percent. And they're looking at that going, if the trajectory continues, then Islam's just going to die. And what, what are we going to do about it? And so they don't know what to do. They have no clue how to deal with this. Uh, but in Islam, the solution to every conceivable problem is always to get more violent, more aggressive, more in your face, more confrontational. And so you see this all all across the uh, the Muslim world. And the the positive side, the positive side is if they try all this, oh, we're going to bring back Hagia Sophia as a mosque and we're going to bring back this other place as a mosque. We're going to crack down. We're going to launch new jihad attacks. We're going to establish the caliphate over here. And we're going to be in your face with dawah nonstop. And we're going to be uh, complaining about Jews 24 uh, seven. That'll work. But if that doesn't work, Work, they got nothing left. There is no there. There is no plan after that. You see, they they under, They kind of understand. The leaders kind of understand. It's now, and if this doesn't work, Islam crumbles. So we have to put everything in the now. And the good side and the positive side is, if they fail, that if they fail, when all they there, this is their last. Mm -hmm. This is their last chance. Um, yeah, there will still be Islam and so on. There will still be problems with Islam. But if this doesn't work and it actually crumbles, it's gonna. They're not gonna be able to. Not gonna be able to do anything about it. Yeah, you could start to see a catastrophic decline in the numbers of Muslims, as we've already seen in Iran, and has been very little remarked upon outside of our conversations here and, and, and your conversations elsewhere, that only 40% of the people in Iran, which is supposed to be 99% Muslim, identified themselves as Muslims in a recent survey. That's just staggering. Mm -hmm. And it shows that, well, people don't like Sharia, and they don't like living under it. No, they don't. And uh, me and AP were just doing a show maybe a couple weeks, maybe two weeks ago or so ago. But uh, it, we're talking about uh, MBS, the uh, crown prince of Saudi Arabia and the recent changes here. Now, keep in mind, this is a guy who will uh, will apparently have you murdered if you're on the wrong side of him. But uh, what else? You know, they they made it so women can drive. And that was a pretty huge step for them. But then it just snowballed. And then they're having con uh, concerts with like Iggy Azalea. Uh, twerking on stage and telling people to worship the goddess worship the goddess and so on yeah iggy and azalea did iggy, yeah. i don't know who iggy azalea is but did, did this person get beheaded 
No, no, they're they're being invited. So Metallica, uh, Nicki, Nicki Minaj, they're all being brought there for concerts. They opened a bikini beach, so now there's a now there's a beach in Saudi, in Arabia, Saudi Arabia where you can. Yeah, where you can go and wear bikinis. They've legalized alcohol in certain areas, so now you can actually in in, in a certain places you can uh you can uh you can you can buy a, a rum and coke and so on. So Incredible. they're doing all this stuff, and it's like this rapidly. But I saw a, a little interview from a, a woman at one of the be at the beach and so on. She was saying, a couple of years ago, we weren't allowed to listen to music. We could not listen to music. We would be in trouble for listening to music. And now we're walking. Now ladies are walking around in bikinis. And so anyway, the point is, um, oh, and, and one of the things one of the things we found out uh, as we were doing the show on MBS was uh, it's estimated between five and 10 percent of Saudis uh, in Saudi Arabia are actually closet atheists. And oh, so, yeah, 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 maybe more than that. But I mean, keep in mind that like they they just they're just now allowed to do all this stuff. And mm -hmm. they're just now getting all these uh, additional sporting events and music concerts and so on. And uh, yep, times are a changing. And so when the times are a changing, the, the Dawa clowns are a panicking. Well, Erdogan is moving in the other direction over mm -hmm. in Turkey. And, He's trying uh, there's the charming fellow himself. And what a loser. <laughs> Erdogan recently was speaking in Izmir, Smyrna, which is uh, near where my family is from, less than an hour away. And so I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there, Mr. Erdogan. But he said that hostility against Sharia law is hostility against Islam, which I think that in light of his avowed Islamic bona fides, he's very likely to impose Sharia or as much of it as he can possibly get away with in Turkey as soon as he can. He also went on to say, if you look at the history books, you will see that Turk equals Muslim. A definition of Turkishness without the inclusion of Islam's holy war spirit is merely an attempt to turn the Turkish nation into a folklore tale. And he says Sharia represents the entirety of Islam's rules on life and he threatened those who dare to criticize it. To encourage imams not to limit themselves to it working inside mosques, but to uh, increase their presence in Turkish society. So as Saudi Arabia becomes secular, it looks like Turkey is going to fill the gap. It'll collapse. Oh yeah, well they always do. Meanwhile, in Iran, where they've been trying this for quite some time, we have, where's, I know I have pictures of these guys. Now that's, in Iran, that's a perfect example. So they, they're, looking, they're looking at the numbers too. And mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of obvious, it's kind of obvious, like if we don't handle this right now, uh, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late 10 years from now. So we have to basically, their theory is, we'll start a war with absolutely everyone and hope the Mahdi comes and rescues us. Yeah, and so this is Ali Reza and Amir Nur Muhammadi. And uh, their name, of course, their surname there means Light of Muhammad, but they are actually Christians, and they have been arrested and charged, and here's the charge. They were charged with, the quote is, deviant educational or propaganda activities contrary to the holy Islamic law by making false claims in religious fields. And they've also been charged more succinctly with propaganda against the state. Now, David, these guys, they, all they did was convert to Christianity. How is this mm -hmm. propaganda against the state or uh, activities that make that are, that are contrary to holy Islamic law? Surely holy Islamic law is tolerant and peaceful, right? Yeah, well... Uh... You're gonna to have to. You're gonna to have to read some books, Robert. Uh, yeah. I recommend. I recommend the Critical Quran. Forget the author, but go ahead and get that uh, and uh, get a history of jihad. That'll that'll be pretty helpful. Oh, who, um, who wrote those? I I, I yeah, never wrote those. Yeah, some guy everyone keeps telling me is a racist, Islamophobic, hate mongering bigot because he is <laughs> against. Uh, since he's against uh, child rape and pedophilia and all that stuff. Anyway, incredible. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but. 
Yeah, so what, what, what you actually see, and you see this all over the world, you have what Sharia calls for. And under Sharia, you're not allowed to, of course, leave Islam. You're not going to be allowed to go around preaching the gospel to Muslims and so on. Um, but it's hard to just say, in lots of places, it's hard to just say, hey, we want to execute apostates or we want to do this or we want to do that because you'll get blasted. And so they kind of they kind of have to uh, put it in different language. They have to, you know, ah, this is a crime against the state. Well, why? It's the exact same thing. But so anyway, they want to punish people for doing the exact same things um, that are, you know, against the law under Sharia. But they want to I don't know if they want to dress it up to make it sound uh, sound like it is something yeah. uh, that is that a state should be punishing people for palatable to the international media, which is, of course, entirely sympathetic to them and on their side. All right. Uh, let's see. My goodness, so many things. All right, let's go to Italy. In Italy, we had a terrible story out of Catania, a 13-year-old girl raped by a gang of seven Egyptian boys in the municipal gardens of Villa Bellini, one of the two oldest gardens in the Sicilian city of Catania. Now, uh, we always hear stories like this, and people sometimes claim that these are just crimes that people commit, and that, you know, everybody, there, there's rapists in every country of all ethnicities. So it's just Islamophobic and picking on Muslims to have this in a show called This Week in Jihad. What do you think, David? Is it just is is this just racism and bigotry? Um, no, and we have to be clear uh, when we talk about let's say wife beating in Islam. It's true; uh, someone from any background could beat his wife. Uh, when we talk about rape, yes, someone from all sorts of backgrounds could just be evil and uh, rape someone. So you can have you can have all kinds of non-Muslims doing the exact same things. There's a huge difference, though, in that wife beating is actually promoted in Islam, that rape of non-Muslims is actually promoted in Islam. It's one of the goals, conquering people and taking their wives and daughters as your sex slaves. Um, so when we when we point this out in Islam, notice if, if someone if someone from some other uh, who some non-Muslim is a rapist, he has to be constantly hiding uh, what he's done, he tries to evade being captured and police will find if the police find the person, he goes on trial and he gets sentenced to prison. Uh, everyone understands it's wrong. Uh, one of the things we've seen with like the grooming gangs and some of these other situations is it'll be it, it'll be a family affair. It'll be three brothers and their father and their uncle and grandpa. And they're all gathered together, gang raping these young girls. Why? Because they don't believe it's wrong and they don't believe it's something you need to hide. They believe it's perfectly acceptable, uh, similar with wife beating and so on. And so, yeah, there's a problem in that. Yes, any person could conceivably do certain things, but most of the world's population at least recognizes these things as wrong whereas there is a population that that thinks these things are perfectly acceptable and that's a problem yeah you know it's amazing david years ago i read a book that maybe some of you uh in in our viewing audience tonight have read the abolition of man by c.s lewis uh and he is in that book discussing the moral law that is common across religions and cultures and there's it's a very short book and there's an appendix where he includes all these quotes from the various religions showing that they all say don't kill don't commit adultery don't steal the various things that are in the ten commandments and what's remarkable about the book is that islam is not in this list that when he's giving these texts showing that the moral law is universal across various religious traditions, it's not in Islam. And it's true that, you know, while Islam has these prohibitions, at the same time, they're gigantic loopholes, particularly when it comes to the treatment of unbelievers. And then suddenly all bets are off.
Yeah, and I forget the uh, I forget the exact quote, but uh, I mean, lots of di- lots of groups around the world have some mm-hmm. version of what's called the golden rule: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, I, I found one that's kind of similar in the Muslim sources, but it's clearly only referring to fellow Muslims. It's not mm-hmm. it's not it's not do unto non-Muslims as you would have them do unto you. And this is the this is this ongoing problem that. Uh, and, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier that, you know, you have you, you have the, the features of a society and a feature of leaders that would sort of work well in the modern world where some level of tolerance is is valued and encouraged and praised and so on. And you have the traditional Muslim way of doing things. And certain Muslim leaders are realizing, hey, if we just you know, if we keep up this this uh, trying to get along with everyone then it's not going to work because everything is going to, you know, uh, apostasy rates are skyrocketing. So we have to we have to go the the uh, the traditional route. But um, yeah, so you've got this sort of thing going on. But this goes back to Islam. And it's since there's no real concept of a golden rule that applies to other people, it's we're going to do things to you that we would moan and wail and freak out about if you tried to do them to us. And so you've got Muslims around the world living these sort of double lives where they'll say, oh, look what Israel is doing. Oh, this is so evil. We're going to conquer the world and subjugate everybody. Ha ha. Oh, look what this country did. They, they, someone tugged on a, on a hijab there. Ah, we're going we're gonna to kill women who refuse to wear the hijab. And they're like living this double life where they get to crack down on everyone and control the entire world and subjugate everyone and abuse people in every possible way and rape and kill and everything. But we're all supposed to be ext- the entire world is supposed to grovel at their feet um and my goodness uh, I, I can't wait for this to break down well you know david this is very interesting there are a lot of stories this week about this kind of double standard and about the difference between the values that you uh were explaining moments ago in regard to rape that these rape gangs the, all the relatives join in because they don't think there's anything wrong with it. And there's nothing, that, none of the furtiveness or the uh, secrecy that it generally is involved if somebody is a rapist in a non-Muslim context because the non-Muslim rapist can take for granted that everybody thinks it's wrong. And another example of that is uh, everybody hates Hitler, right? Do you know anybody that loves Hitler? I don't know anybody that loves Hitler. And yet, in the Islamic world, Mein Kampf is a perennial bestseller. And there's a new movie out in Egypt, David. It's called A Century and Six Years. And you see how it says on the poster, it says, Jury Prize. It's it's winning prizes. And I, I looked up, all these prizes are in places like uh, Qatar and, and, and various other film festivals in the Islamic world. And this is the wonderful story of the grandson of the Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajimin al-Husseini, who lived in Berlin during World War II and was friends with the Nazis, made pro-Nazi broadcasts and so on. Uh, His grandson supposedly goes to Germany and demands that the Germans honor Hitler's promise to leave all of Palestine free of Jews. And so this movie is a big hit in Egypt because they love this idea and they love Hitler. And so while the rest of the world agrees Hitler was a monstrous human being, one of the most evil people who ever lived, he's a big hero in the Islamic world. Yep. One of life's great mysteries. <laughs> okay, in Spain, in Montellano, we had a, a teenager who was manufacturing Mother of Satan explosives, which was the deadly explosives that blew up in the house of a group of jihadis in Catalonia in 2017. They had a work accident, apparently. And uh, this 16-year-old Syrian refugee intended to show up at school with his mother of Satan explosives. 
and uh, commit mass murder there in the name of Allah. 16 years old. Now, what on earth? David, 16 years old. Surely he must have fallen in with the wrong crowd. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, that happens all the time. Yep. You but you... but notice notice there's there's a there's another there's another parallel here to what we were just saying in that you do have just random uh, random kids who decide to become school shooters or something like that. So you can you can have that. It's not like a commu it's not like a communal thing. It's some it's some kid who's got some serious problems uh, decides to go and shoot up a school. But in Islam, this would be considered by a lot of people a really, really awesome uh, thing to do and an awesome and noble thing to do if you're taking out uh, if you're taking out as many kufar as possible and terrorizing people in the name of Allah. I have to say, though, if that if that stuff, that explosive is called what? Mother of Mother what? of Satan. Mother of Satan. That would I mean, the proper name would be Amina. Well, um, it just says Mother of Satan in the story from Spain. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, but Muhammad's mom's name was Amina, so Yikes. So that would make yeah, that yeah, <laughs> that's Amina. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh let's see. I wanted to go to the Islamic Society, Fort Hamilton Islamic Society of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Did you ever go there, David, when you're living there? You uh I don't recall. I don't believe I ever made it there um, myself in uh, in those days. But this is, oh, here he is. This is a preacher who preached a Friday sermon there not too long ago. From the picture, he looks to me to be very young. But in any case, uh, Fort Hamilton Islamic Society of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And he said that the Jews have incurred the wrath of Allah because they changed the words that Allah gave them. He said, how corrupt, how evil does one have to be to change the sacred book? And who is Allah angry with? The prophet says the Jews are those who have incurred the wrath of Allah. Why? And then he goes into that about changing the, the words and goes on to say they killed the prophets the Christians are complicit and agree and support them. And then he says that Allah tells us what they are saying right now, apparently criticizing the Hamas attack of October 7th, is just the tip of the iceberg. What they conceal in their hearts of hatred for you and your religion is greater. And so he turns it around and says, let us take these lessons and teach them to our children. Teach them to hate everything about kufr, which is unbelief. The holidays, the dress, the manners, and everything. He must not mean it, right? He must mean love everything about the kufr, right? Because that's yeah. what uh, we'd expect from the from from a peaceful religion. Yeah, yeah. A couple of things here. Uh, so, uh, hats off to memory for doing their mm -hmm. job, uh, doing this awesome job they're doing uh, of exposing all this stuff. Um, but yeah, memory. Uh, puts out lots of these videos they do lots of translations and so on uh then you got the then you've got these young guys and they preach in like brooklyn and stuff like this and it's like guys you want sharia so bad there there's afghanistan you can jump on it you can get on a plane go to afghanistan you can do it it can be done uh no they don't want to do that they don't they don't they don't want to do that they don't yeah it's like, i remember <laughs> uh uh Hikikaju, i think it was saying that that uh he doesn't he he can't go anywhere because american uh influence is so all pervasive and the american yeah. military and intelligence people they, they yeah. they've spoiled every sharia place and then i think wait a minute islam's supposed to be the solution to mm. secularism and yet secularism is defeating islam everywhere mm -hmm. yeah so, wherever you go yeah yeah there's no there's nowhere to go anymore because because no one likes no one likes sharia so i'll just try to do it here in the united states yeah great luck with that genius uh, so anyway, so it's it's another example of there are places that are uh, much closer to Islamic law than the United States, and they don't want to go there. Uh, so Afghanistan, Pakistan, they could go to these places. They don't want to. And so it's like they it's like they want the struggle for Sharia, but don't actually want to live under it uh, because, you know, the struggle makes them feel like they're, you know, we're, we're making a difference and so on. No, you're not. You're making fools out of yourselves. Uh, so you got that, and then you, but then you have that confusing claim of the guy and uh, oh, the Jews corrupted their book and blah blah blah. 
uh, Muhammad didn't. Muhammad had no clue about that. Neither did Allah. Muhammad had Indeed. the Jews of his time bring him a copy of the Torah, and he said of the to the copy of the Torah, he spoke directly to the copy of the Torah and said, "I believe in you and in the one who revealed you." And according to Allah, no one can change his words. He says that repeatedly in the Quran, refer, even even in the context of, of referring to his written words, uh, no one can change his words. And you've got Muslims all over the place saying, no, Allah's too stupid and Muhammad was too <laughs> dumb. They didn't even realize that his words have been re repeatedly changed and corrupted. And so, I mean, he, who's the real Islamophobe? I'd say this guy is. But you could, I mean, you, you could just, I mean, just imagine this situation. What this guy is saying is, Allah says he revealed the Torah. Um, Allah says that he protected the Torah. Allah says that no one can change the Torah. Allah commands Jews to judge by the Torah. And yet he believes the Jews completely overpowered Allah and corrupted it anyway, even though Allah says he would never allow it to happen. What this guy's saying and why he's so mad at the Jews is the Jews are apparently more powerful than Allah. Allah says, no one can do this. And the Jews, of course, in this guy's mind, say, oh, yes, we can. We'll overpower Allah. And Allah oh, please, Jews, I can't. Oh, you're too powerful for me. Come on. David, I'm uh, getting a lot of requests here because this clown, we've, we've seen him before in weeks past. This clown showed up again threatening to do to you what he did to Hatun several years ago, which, of course, Hatun was stabbed in Speaker's Corner several years ago for criticizing Islam. And so we're getting oh, so a lot spamming. of requests from... Remember, uh, remember people. what we did to Hatun. Yeah, what? Saying, what? You, what? You guys? You guys tried to kill her, and the the handle on your knife broke. Yeah, a bunch of wow, a bunch of world class <laughs> assassins. You guys are. But you see, you get a lot of. We're getting a lot of requests here that you eat a Quran page. Oh yeah, for, yeah, I, yeah. I can do that. Guy. Yeah, I can do that. It doesn't seem to affect him though. He's some weirdo who doesn't. Uh, he doesn't know uh, Surah six verse one hundred eight of the Quran orders him not to be insulting. You know, be insulting people who are going to mm -hmm. insult the religion in return. But yeah, here we go, guys. Look at this. This is looking. This is looking pretty bad here. I mean, I can see all the pages that have been uh, ripped up, shredded, eaten by because of, of guys like this who just want attention more than they care about their book. But, yeah, that's on you. Your decisions, Mr. Mahmoud. This is your decision. We didn't start off. Uh, Robert started telling me about it, and I, I didn't even know where he was going. This was not on our radar. I had zero intentions of chewing up and spitting out a page of the Quran. It's your actions that cause this stuff. Now, now, just tell me, uh, just tell me, uh, Mr. Mahmoud, you look back at, oh, look what we did to Hatun. I, I, I don't know what you're watching. Christians think that was awesome. She got stabbed repeatedly at Speaker's Corner, jumped up and started preaching the gospel to people. We look at that and say, that is awesome. Uh, how many people are going to praise you for repeatedly causing your book to be chewed up and spit out? You want, you want to do the math for us? Ah. Uh, <laughs> now I feel like a goat. <laughs> yeah, the goat that, like the, the goat, goat that, that ate, that ate the part. Quran. Yeah. Uh -huh. What was it? The part about the part about breastfeeding. Uh huh. Well, actually, um, uh, Sunanib bin uh, Sunanib bin Majah, 1944, mentions the verse of breastfeeding an adult, uh, and mm -hmm. of um. Uh, the verse of stoning an adulteress. And it's interesting that Aisha focuses on those because uh, she was accused of committing adultery. Um, and then in order to get her off the, you know, get her off because Muhammad really, really liked her. Um, he, he came up with this rule about how you have to have four wit fail, four male witnesses to, to be able to accuse someone of something. So that was to get Aisha uh, off uh, the charge. Uh, and the, the other thing was breastfeeding adults. Uh, where if a woman's going to be around someone, around a grown man, then Muhammad and Allah's solution to any concerns about them, you know, hooking up um, is to have the woman breastfeed him and then he'll be like her son and then he won't be sexually attracted to her anymore and you don't have to worry about it. So brilliant stuff. Any woman in the world, I would say any any man in the world should instantly think of that as the stupidest thing that's ever been claimed by anyone to be a revelation. Uh, but I, so Aisha mentions those verses, but uh, notice this, th there would have been more here. And according to Ubay ibn Kab, according to Ubay ibn Kab in, uh, in, in, uh, in Abu Ubaid, uh, uh, over 200 verses were lost from Surah 33, just mm -hmm. from Surah 33. 
over 200 verses. He said it used to be as long as Surat al-Baqarah, yep. and now it's not. Now it's a fraction of that. And what happened? So this uh, this goat or sheep did some serious. By the way, a little side note, Robert. Uh, there, there's a there's a conflict in the Muslim sources. Some say it was a sheep that ate the verses. Some say it was a goat that ate them. Uh, we actually tested this. <laughs> we actually tested this. <laughs> we, we put we put some uh, we put some pages in front of a sheep and, and in front of a goat. We we got video footage of that. But uh, yeah, this was done on a farm with a bunch of sheep and goats. And we can confirm that a goat is massively, massively more likely to eat uh, pages of a Quran than a, than a sheep is. So we can we can actually settle this matter scientifically all these years later. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, I think you should get an award from Al Azhar for that. Yeah. 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 I know. I mean, this is it's it's interesting. Like you have this you have you have this in the Muslim sources, and they don't know what to, they don't know what the case is, and we can actually figure it out and help them. Mm-hmm. Uh, nowadays, uh, but yeah, so uh, a bunch of that was eaten <clears throat> by let's let's go ahead and say it. We could say it here. A goat. It was a goat. Uh, but you're, you're talking over 200 verses, and if you read Surah 33 today, it is one of the most hideous and repulsive and revolting chapters of the Quran, and that's after Muhammad's wives conspired to edit out the worst parts, and it's still one of the most horrifyingly evil uh, things in, in existence. <laughs> all right uh while you're digesting this issue we're gonna go to some stupid infidels uh let's see what is this guy's name all right this is kairi sadalla and Kairi Sadalla murdered three people in Britain, James Furlong, Joseph Ritchie Bennett, and David Wales in 2020. And mm. this was after he had been jailed five times for a string of violent offenses, and every time he was referred to mental health facilities. And finally, he was granted humanitarian leave to remain in the country so he will not be deported even though he is uh, a migrant from Libya because he was able to argue that Libya was unsafe and mm. he might be threatened there. So this yeah. guy who murdered three people, he uh, gets to stay in Britain. What do you think, David? Yeah, well, that's kind of a messed up dude. You know what I mean? I was safe. <laughs> yeah, I should come over from Libya and start killing him. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that Quran bit stuck in my mouth. Um, yeah, w- this is also something that keeps coming up. Why are all these guys who are obviously jihadis, hell bent on slaughtering unbelievers in the name of Allah? Why do they? Why do people keep thinking? Oh, these guys just need mental health treatment. It's because of the bang up job politicians and the media and educators have done to convince the population of the world that Islam is actually peaceful and the Quran is so clear when it says things like there's no compulsion in religion or if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. You've got people around the world just because they heard this on CNN or they heard it from Barack Obama or something. They think, look, Islam is clearly, clearly a religion of peace, tolerance and candy coated raindrops. And so what's what's the implication of that? The implication is, well, if Islam is that obviously peaceful, then anyone who says, oh, I have to go out and kill for this has to be insane. You'd have to be insane to read it the way Muslims have been reading it for 14 centuries until, you know, until now. Um, You'd have to be insane to interpret fight those who do not believe as fight those who do not believe. Uh, You'd have to be absolutely insane to read Muhammad's words. Uh, if anyone leaves his religion, kill him. You'd have to be insane to read that as if anyone leaves his religion, kill him. And <coughs> so it's it's just they're, they're going to keep they're going to keep assuming that these guys just need mental health treatment when these guys are just able to read words off a page. Yep, it's really incredible. But uh, there was another example of exactly that in France. Uh, as always in France, it seems like. For some reason, David, you know, practically every time we do this show, if not every last time, there has been 
stories of Muslims stabbing people at random on streets in France. And they just go by, and nobody seems to care. But for mm-hmm. some reason, this one got a lot of attention in the English language press. And this was, uh, this is the guy. His uh, name is Kasog. Something Kasog. Hold on. Looking for it. It's not in every story, unfortunately. Um, anyway, he, uh, Sagu Gunu Kasog. And he is from Mali. And not long before... He went out and uh, he stabbed people with, he stabbed three people with a knife at uh, the Paris train station. He went on TikTok, and this, this picture is from his TikTok video, where he said, actually it was three months before he attacked, and he said that uh, in three months, Allah was going to welcome him into paradise. All right, so that's pretty open and shut. The guy says three months ago, in three months, Allah's going to uh, accept me into paradise. And then three months later, he gets a knife and he goes to the Paris train station and he stabs three infidels at random. But the uh, cops immediately ruled out terrorism, said this was not a terrorist attack because they found medication on him. Mm. And he is mentally ill. Mm-hmm. Well, he'd have to be if he concluded that Allah wants him to do what he says. Yeah, they have no frame of reference because they've already ruled out jihad as any kind of real thing. And so with lacking any frame of reference to understand it, they have to classify all these people as mentally ill. But it's just increasingly absurd. Yep. And, sudden, uh, sudden, sudden onset jihad syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, it's eventually the, it's going to be doing a disservice to people who are actually mentally ill because the hospitals are going to be full of violent jihadis and, Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be killing the men, the real mentally ill. Well, it's just going to be a big mess. As someone who's been in some mental hospitals, I've been to a regular mental hospital and to like a criminal mental hospital. I think the crim- people in the criminal mental hospital give them a run for the money if they decide to get violent. <laughs> I've well, seen some mess. There are some messed up dudes in there. It's going to be very interesting. <laughs> they probably go to the easier mental hospitals, though, because everybody. Yeah, they probably would. Oh, you can't put them in there with these uh, violent criminals. We have to put them in there with all these peaceful old ladies. Exactly. Uh, right. I'm looking for the picture. Um, I know I had a picture of this, but the problem is the thumbnails are so small. Is this it? Yeah, that's it. Uh, okay. These two guys, the guy on the left is a, uh, Tunisian who lives in France. And, uh, you can see a couple of signs of how devout he is, his Palestinian scarf here and his, uh, Islamic books on the shelf. And he's talking to, on TikTok, an ex-Muslim. And he said to the ex-Muslim, if I had the chance and a weapon, I would kill you. So the first thing I wanted to ask David is, surely that's not Islamic, am I right? Uh, Of course it's not, as long as you ignore everything Muhammad ever said about uh, killing apostates. Indeed. Muhammad said, if anybody changes his religion, kill him. So this guy, he says to the ex-Muslim, if I had a chance and a weapon, I'd kill you. And so the ex-Muslim says to him, look, you live in France. In France, they allow mocking of the prophet and of Islam. Why on earth did you, a devout Muslim, move from Tunisia, where that kind of behavior would be against the law, to France, where it's tolerated? And he said, I came here because of the money they give us. Mm. I have to say, Robert, looking at this guy. Yep. This story was was much uh, was much better and much happier than I anticipated, because it's just, you know, him talking trash to an ex-Muslim and uh, and the ex-Muslim responding. And so when I saw that, dude, I was I was like 80 uh, percent sure it was going to be here's a uh, here's a Muslim living in France who uh, dressed up as Santa Claus for Christmas so he could get little boys and girls to sit on his lap. And then uh, it turns out the guy's a pedophile. I thought that was going to be the story. 
Well, you never know. The guy's going to wake up tomorrow and do something in France. But in any case, we can hope he won't cause any damage. In the meantime, that guy, that guy ain't going to do anything. It's too early. The bakery hasn't even opened yet. <laughs> he says, I came here because of the money that they give me. Now, what is the that money, all about? The money and the croissants. And I could buy many, many croissants. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to wage, I'm going to do jihad on you right after I stop at the bakery. The money comes from the idea in Islam that the non-Muslim owes the Muslim upkeep. And that goes back to chapter 9, verse 29, which of course says that the non-Muslims must pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. If there's no jizya, then going to a state like France and collecting welfare is considered to be altogether fitting and proper because, after all, that is what the non-Muslims are supposed to be doing. And uh, th there are two really awesome ways to get money if you can get to a place like France or the UK or something like that from uh, from a Muslim country. Uh, so you get, um, you of course, get uh, state welfare and so on. So the people of that country will fund you to live in their country. They'll pay you to live there. Uh, but also, if you're like this guy and you start, oh, you know, we have to kill the apostates who we're going to and caliphate. Uh, Muslims will start sending you money. And that's why, I mean, Dawa, becoming a da'i right now is a very lucrative ca career because uh, tying this in with all the stuff about Muslims being in a state of panic, they're ready to rally around anyone who says, and I'm the one who can save us from from the, the avalanche of apostasy and the, oh, yes, let's, yes, give this guy all the money in the world to save, to save his son from all these things. And these guys know this. But uh, just going back to the welfare, I, I I mean, I can almost guarantee I can almost guarantee you this guy has like three or four wives just because mm -hmm. that's what happened when people were doing it for those kinds of reasons. Um, I saw Muslims explain. I saw Muslims explaining in their in a in a Islamic like discussion group uh, at one point saying that it's understood that in a Muslim in most Muslim countries, unless you're wealthy, you can't have three or four wives because you have to keep up residences and so on. It's very, very expensive. They said it's understood among Muslims. If you can just get to a Western nation, you marry three or four women in a Western nation and you get your marriages at the mosque. So they're not recognized by the state. As far as the state is concerned, these are single mothers. And they all get state benefits and the state pays for you to be polygamous. And they said it's understood. If I'm here, I might get one wife. If I get to there, I can have four wives and four houses and I don't have to pay a penny for any of it because the Absolutely. state will fund you. Yep. Wow. Germany just made an explicit uh, uh, exception for Afghan polygamists and they're bringing them over when uh, Germany, of course, it's still technically illegal, but not for the Muslims. Yeah, you always have to change your rules for Islam. Yes, indeed. All right, let's go to Australia. And we got uh, Habib. We're going we're gonna to go to Australia and cuddle a, cuddle a koala. Yes. And this is, there he is, cuddly as ever. There's Habib Musa. And Habib Musa turns out to have been the culprit in a very controversial and celebrated incident in Australia, in Melbourne. In Melbourne, there was a popular burger joint called Burger Tory. And uh, I think that's an interesting name in light of the fact that it was owned by Hashtaya. And Hashtaya is a Palestinian Muslim. So why he would name his burger joint with a play on words for a Catholic religious doctrine, I do not know. But Burger Tory was a popular burger joint in Melbourne until... Pretty, pretty, that's pretty, I, I give it to him. That's a pretty funny name. Yeah, there you go. So everybody loves Burgatory, mm -hmm. and you, you serve your time there, and then you go to paradise, and so you're mm -hmm. good. So in Burgatory, Burgatory, though, outside of it, there was a clash between supporters of Israel and supporters of Hamas, and Burgatory was burned down. And Hashtaya claimed that it was the Jews who burned down Burgatory. And it became a big deal in Australia. 
And there were all these discussions in the media about what are we going to do about these violent Jewish gangs that are terrorizing Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but right here in Melbourne, Australia, and burning down places like Burgatory. But now it has come out. The culprit was not Jewish at all, but a Muslim named Habib Musa. He burned down Burgatory. Now, why would Habib Musa, a Muslim, burn down a Muslim-owned burger joint? Uh, I mean, I can think of multiple reasons. Yes. It could be it could be a staged uh, hate crime, like we see from people like Sheikh Uthman, who uh, you know squirt ketchup all over themselves, and oh, I've been a victim to Kufar. They got me. Send me more money. Uh, so it could be that sort of situation. Can just be a, a, you know an insurance thing if a burger tory wasn't working out pretty well. Uh, could be from the wrong sect of Islam. So these guys had a dispute, and I'll burn down your burger joint as payback. So multiple multiple possibilities there. Yeah, it does seem to be multiple possibilities, but I do think it's most likely that this was an attempt to stage an anti-Muslim hate crime. There are many more fake anti-Muslim hate crimes than real ones, and so this is yet hey. another. Yep. Hey, what was uh, what was um, what was uh, back in the day? There was uh, Baskin Robbins, and they had a certain number of flavors. What was it? Thirty-seven 31. flavors or something? Thirty-one, 31 flavors. Fla- 31 flavors. I'm just thinking because, you know, this guy's name in his uh, Muslim guy's name in his burger place, Burgatory, not realizing that you could have some it could be considered uh, intolerant towards Catholics and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe we'll make an ice cream place and we'll call it. Check this out. We'll call it uh, Paradise Cream, Paradise Cream. Oh, and yeah, yeah. instead instead of the 31 flavors it'll be 72 versions of is of uh, of ice cream Got i love it? this 70, 72 versions and, and, and but that actually reminds me of that other hadith about that there will be 70 isn't it 72 or 73 70 versions yes of 70, Islam and yeah 73 and then yeah and then the jews have 72 and i think the christians have 71 or something yeah, like that yeah. and so wow you see we're gonna have the most <laughs> it seems like it seems like something dumb Muhammad would say. He's gonna. It's like one day he's saying we're gonna have the most sex in paradise, and people are like, "What? The most sex? Oh, we're gonna have seventy three? What a dope!" Yep. <laughs> okay, let me find uh, this lady here. But remember, only only one of those seventy three sects uh, is the true. Is the, the only true one? Religion. But you don't know what, if you're in it or not, so you're probably headed for hellfire. Yep, and every every last Muslim group thinks they're the uh, they're the correct one. Yep, this is Ala Busir, and she is Irish. She grew up in Dublin, and she said the other day. Let's see, let me get the quote here. She said she, she was uh, she's a professional whiner. She's a professional victim. Uh, what she does is she does photographic and film projects that call attention to racism, discrimination against Muslims, and discrimination involving the war on terror. And so that's what she does for a living. And so she was recently on Irish public television, which is no doubt quite a cheerful place. And she said this, a person looks at you and then he They'll give you that some stereotype joke and you'll be like, shh, like it's not a joke. It's something serious that you shouldn't be saying and everything. But then you'll get, ah, but we're Irish. We like to joke around. We like to make a fun, a laugh out of something. And that needs to change within the Irish community. As much as I'm Irish, that's the one thing that it kind of annoys me. It People needs keep to joking. change. The Irish got to stop joking. They gotta stop all this joking. I no more, no more hearts, clovers, diamonds, horseshoes. No more frosted lucky charms. No more. Leprechauns. No more joking. No more joking. No more leprechauns. That's all shirk. That's right. It's gin, not leprechauns. And the gins don't joke. They have no sense of humor. Nope. Not nary a bit. All right. Uh, where is he? Do I have him here? This is Brandon Johnson. 
and he's the mayor of Chicago. He's doing a bang up job up there. Yeah, well, you know, uh, in Chicago, of course, they call it uh, Chirac because it's so violent. It reminds people of Iraq during the war, and uh, it's got they've got shootings all the time. Every weekend, you read about another dozen people, twenty seven people, whatever, shot dead on the streets of Chicago. So what did they do in Chicago to fix this? They passed an unconditional resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. I think they need a ceasefire in Chicago, but they didn't call for a resolution for that. I mean, it is just, I mean, the priorities are just shocking. They have the, you know, they have the gun and murder capital of the West and we're gonna tell we're gonna tell Israel what to do about all the violence over there, guys. You are the last people on the planet, and possibly the last people in history, who should be lecturing anyone on how to deal with violence. Indeed. In fact, in fact, what you should be saying, what they should be saying, is this: Hey, Israel, once you deal with Hamas, can you come over and help us? Because we got some problems over here. Now that would so, be exciting. So can you can you show us how to deal with uh, with gun violence? We we need some help. I love it. Can you imagine the IDF keeping order in Chicago? Mm-hmm. Oh man, I can just hear the screams from the Council on American Islamic Relations right now. All right, we got another mayor. This is Abdullah Hamoud, who is the mayor of Dearborn, Michigan. And. Uh, mm. My home away from home. Whatever happened to uh, Mayor O'Reilly? Talking I, trash I about talking trash about me twenty four seven over there. But this is Abdullah Hamoud, who is the current mayor of Dearborn, Michigan. And what happened was, the Wall Street Journal, which has not been very uh, up to date on this issue to say the least, they published a big story last Friday called "Welcome to Dearborn, America's Jihad Capital." With the subtitle, Imams and Politicians in the Michigan City Side with Hamas Against Israel and Iran Against the U.S. And By the way, the, Robert, did you, yeah. did, you catch, did you catch who wrote that article? Steven Stalinsky. That's, that's the guy who runs memory, isn't it? Yes. That is awesome. How awesome is that? This yeah, guy's like writing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so it was very good. It was a very good article. It was full of quotes, which, of course, memory has at its fingertips of uh, imams in Dearborn preaching hatred, preaching the destruction of Israel, praising October 7th, and so on. And so, you know, David, it it seems to me in any sane city, if they said, welcome to Los Angeles, well, Los Angeles ain't sane, but welcome to whatever Mm -hmm. city, and it's America's jihad capital, that people would be concerned. And the mayor might Mm -hmm. say, we're fighting this, we're, we're aware of these jihadis here, and we're fighting against this. But instead, Abdullah Hamoud has been playing victim ever mm-hmm. since this thing came out. And he put let me on guess. Twitter, we're, let me guess. Let me guess, we're all under attack now since this article, it's inciting people against our beloved city, ah, ah, ah something like that. How'd you know, man? It's right here it's on Because Twitter. that's what they do every single time. Every single time. Care, it's the same pattern as of care, right? Like, yep. oh, there's a big terrorist attack of some guy shouting Allahu Akbar and left a manifesto explaining in detail from the Muslim sources why he's been compelled by his religion to do this. And they instantly, oh, but if you say anything about that, then you're calling for violence against uh, the Muslim community. And so just shut up about it. And so it's always... Like any any sane person on the planet could recognize you got a serious problem here and we need to look at it and do something about it. And we're told no, because if so, then you're a, you're a racist and a bigot. Precisely. And so Abdullah Hamoud wrote on Twitter, effective immediately, Dearborn police will ramp up its presence across all places of worship and major infrastructure points. This is a direct result of the inflammatory World Wall Street Journal opinion piece that has led to an, alarm, an alarming increase in bigoted and Islamophobic rhetoric online targeting the city of Dearborn. Stay vigilant. And, and by all this uh, dangerous rhetoric, what they mean is people are criticizing it for being uh, the Sharia capital of the West. Uh, exactly. But I mean, 
my goodness, think about this, right? I mean, the you know the the director of memory he he provides evidence for everything he says right he's got video clips of these guys calling for these things he's got he's got videos of the people who are who are supporting hezbollah and hamas and everyone else right here uh in the united states of america and it's look at all of this stuff look at this stuff and in a sane world when a mayor who let's face it already knows about this stuff if a mayor of a of a city finds out hey there are all these calls for violent resistance and intifada and all these things right here in my city it would be thank you for drawing attention to this now how can we deal with this why doesn't everyone you know let's all get together brainstorm and implement some strategies for dealing with these people calling for jihad calling for the destruction of israel uh supporting terrorism why don't we do something with this instead it's Oh no, we're in danger from people who are pointing out what what our people are saying. We're yeah. in danger from whenever someone points out what that what that uh, imam in that mosque is calling for, then th he's in danger. He's in danger from what? For calling for he's calling for jihad and supporting terrorism right here, and people are pointing it out. He might be harmed. We need to put we need to protect him. Wow. And even Joe Biden got in the act, and he wrote, "Americans know." Whoa, 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 bull. I'm calling bull before you even finish the sentence. Joe Biden wrote. No, Joe Biden didn't write this. Somebody wrote this. Okay, good. But it was on Joe's Twitter. Someone, someone wrote for Joe. Yes. Americans know. It's like when it's like when you say Joe Biden said. It's like in a sense he said it. In a sense, the words came out of his mouth. But really, someone else said it on his teleprompter for him to repeat. But, Quite okay. so. Now, we, now, we, now we've got that settled. All right. Americans know that blaming a group of people based on the words of a small few is wrong. Now, where did this ever happen? He, of course, it didn't. That's exactly what can lead to Islamophobia and anti-Arab hate. And it shouldn't happen to the residents of Dearborn or any American town. We must continue to condemn hate in all its forms. Mm-hmm. Really, all its forms, like even all those of forms. jihad, could, like even like those of hating uh, Jews and uh, hating kufar, and because if so, then he should support exposing that stuff, which is what the Wall Street Journal article did. So I'm confused as to where why people who say yes, we need to expose hate somehow mean only expose hate. If it's not Islamic hate, if it's not if it's not hate from Muslims, then then you're not even allowed to mention it, or you're or you're you're committing acts of hate. It's weird. Yeah, it's because weird actually stuff. that's Very what crazy. that's what Stephen Stalinsky of Memory was doing in the Wall Street Journal. He was exposing their hate, and of course that is Islamophobic to do. So it's it's a giddy world, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on tight, and uh, we will probably not be back here next week. But God willing, we will be back here in the near future as soon as possible with more thrilling jihad news. And until then, keep your head down, pray, hope, and don't worry.